So angina, just a little brief um, tidbit about what this is. I think we're all very familiar with what it is. It's the symptomatic manifestation when oxygen demand in the myocardium cells exceed the available supply. Now, the most common cause is narrowing of the coronary arteries. And we will talk about CAD or coronary artery disease today. But the most common type of, the most common cause of angina is the narrowing of the coronary arteries. Doesn't mean that that's every time. Just because someone has angina does not necessarily mean they have coronary artery disease. Other things can cause that. Vasospasms, thrombosis, aortic stenosis, hypertension, drug use. We add that, drug use. Cocaine, crack, especially. Other things to think about in your treatment plan, if your plan is not relieving symptoms, we may not want to just keep adding medications because of that order of treatment algorithm. We want to stop. We want to assess. We want to check for things like compliance, changes in episode, a, yeah, uh, thinking of other causes. Are they compliant? Uh, are they recording their episodes? I like to have patients begin keeping an angina diary. It's a very quick way for them to jot down when the episode happened, what time it happened, what they were feeling, describing their pain, what relieved it. Did it get relieved at rest? Did they have to take a nitro? Did they have to do something else? And that way I can intervene and evaluate appropriately. And then I can make that part of that patient's medical record as subjective data on their episodes of angina. Works very well. And I can see that in pattern. That's a, a, a great idea for someone that is getting a diagnosis of angina for the first time. So all patients, except those with an allergy, should, re well, not even allergy here, all patients. So this is a good one. All patients, I don't have a caveat to this yet, diagnosed with angina should receive education on the condition, lifestyle modification, be on aspirin therapy daily, and have a short acting nitrate for acute episodes if they're not allergic to the nitrate all patients. We will talk about aspirin therapy. Aspirin therapy, minimal 81 milligrams for angina. I like patients on 325, that's just one aspirin. And here's the scenario that I run into. I will review a patient's allergies and they will tell me that they're allergic to aspirin. And a true allergy to aspirin, although yes, I have seen it before, is not GI upset. How many of you have patients that said, oh, I can't take that aspirin, it makes me sick to my stomach? What do you do in those cases? Do they have, because how many of us know if it makes them sick to their stomach, they're not gonna be compliant with therapy, right? And we have some very specific reasons why we want them taking an aspirin a day, every day for angina, especially if it's caused from narrowing of the coronary arteries, okay? So one thing that I, review with patients is I have them bring me the aspirin bottle that they were taking the aspirin from that made their, them sick to their stomach, if they can. I want to look for a couple of things. I want to look for, is it enteric coated or is it buffered? Okay? How many of us realize that enteric coated and buffered are two different things? Buffered aspirin implies that there is something mixed with that aspirin, with that acetylacetic acid, to buffer it when it hits the GI tract, when it hits the gut, okay? To buffer it against the acid in the stomach. Enteric coated or a coated aspirin implies that there is a film or a coating around that pill to delay the absorption, to delay the, the, um, the release of the medication inside the aspirin. So if they have tried the buffered aspirin and they still get the GI upset, try enteric coated. Okay, we really want to try our best to move through and to figure out a way to help patients be compliant with daily aspirin therapy, especially with this diagnosis.